He was the flamboyant, controversial symbol of America's dogged resolve during World War II. With his trademark corncob pipe and his love of self-publicity, he is among the most well-known of war heroes. Though he often disregarded authority, he was still praised for his bold, imaginative military strategy. In today's biographics, we look into the rather colorful life of General Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur was born on January 26, 1880, in Little Rock, Arkansas. He was the last of three sons, born to Arthur and Mary MacArthur. His father was a Civil War veteran who had fought with distinction in many battles. He indeed won the Medal of Honor for his bravery, setting a very high bar for his boys. Despite his father having been the state governor of Wisconsin, Arthur fell for a southern belle. Tensions were so high between the states that Mary's brothers refused to attend the wedding. Young Douglas was heavily influenced by his father's military career. He once commented that his first memory was the sound of bugles, and he loved the pomp and ceremony of the army. By the time that Douglas came along, Arthur had been stationed to a series of remote western military posts. When their youngest son was nine years old, the family relocated to Washington, D.C. For the next four years, Douglas attended the Force Public School. In 1893, Arthur was posted to San Antonio, Texas. There, Douglas was enrolled at the West Texas Military Academy. He excelled both academically as well as on the sports field, being named class valedictorian during his final year. His sights were now set on West Point Military Academy. His father tried to use his influence to secure a presidential appointment for his son to the academy, but this was rejected by two presidents, Cleveland and McKinley. This meant that he would have to gain entry the old-fashioned way, by by passing the entrance exam. Arthur hired a tutor to help Douglas prepare for the exam. His diligence it paid off, and he attained a score of 93.3 out of 100. MacArthur later commented on his preparation for the exam, It was a lesson I never forget. Preparedness is the key to success and victory. Douglas's mother instilled in him a firm belief that he was destined for greatness. By the time that he entered West Point, Douglas had developed enough qualities to reinforce that belief. He was strong both mentally and physically, and from his earliest days in military outposts in the West, he became adept at horse riding and rifle shooting. In remembering that time, he said, I learned to read and shoot even before I could read or write, indeed almost before I could walk and talk. The teenage MacArthur, he was tall and handsome, and he projected an air of self-confidence that turned heads whenever he walked into a room. Douglas's first year at West Point was a challenging time for him. As the son of a senior officer and with a mother who stayed close by in a hotel to keep an eye on her beloved boy, he was subjected to more than the usual hazing that all the first years have to endure. Still, he endured it with a stoic resolve that impressed the senior students. While other first year students were broken by the less intense hazing that they experienced, Douglas was able to maintain an air of composure, even cheerfulness throughout the ordeal. Douglas proved to be an outstanding student in all respects. He graduated in 1903, first in his class, with an overall score of 98%. It seemed as if his mother's projections of greatness they were right on track. As a top graduate from West Point, Douglas was now given the opportunity to choose which branch of the armed services that he wanted to enter. He decided on the Engineering Corps, entering the service with the rank of Second Lieutenant. His first posting it was the Philippines, which had been an American colony for five years. His father, Arthur, had served there three years earlier, and he had warned his son, and whoever else would listen, that an insurrection was on the horizon on that island. Douglas was placed in charge of strengthening the military infrastructure on the island. Yet, he had barely been there a month when he was attacked by a pair of bandits while traveling alone in the countryside. He beat off both attackers and then shot them dead. It was an early example of the fierce courage that would go on to be his trademark. This first assignment, it was cut short after less than a year when Douglas contracted malaria. Once he recovered, his father pulled some strings to have Douglas accompany him as a military aide on a tour of Asia. The two years that he spent in places like China, Japan, and India developed within MacArthur ideas about Asia that went against the grain of mainstream political thought. He considered Asian people to be equal to Americans. This in itself undercut the subtle racism which underpinned U.S. policy toward the region. Furthermore, he was of the firm opinion that America's future lay with the Far East and not, as the majority contended, with Europe. This set him rather at odds with the European-centric views of his superiors, something which would persist throughout his lifetime. After his return from Asia, Douglas spent a number of years building up his experience and qualifications in the Engineering Corps. 
He attended engineering school in Washington, after which he was posted to Milwaukee and then Kansas. By that time, he had been promoted to captain. In January of 1912, MacArthur was posted to Panama. This would be a short excursion. He returned the following month to attend the funeral of his father. He was concerned about the mental health of his mother and requested a reposting to Washington, D.C. in order to be close to her. In 1914, MacArthur was assigned to the War Department to serve on the Veracruz expedition in Mexico. Relations between the U.S. and Mexico had been deteriorating for some time. An incident that became known as the Tampico Affair brought matters to a head. Nine American sailors were taken into custody by the Mexican government for entering off-limit areas of the city of Tampico. The sailors, they were released, but the Mexicans refused to provide the 21-gun salute demanded by the American government. An outraged President Woodrow Wilson ordered the invasion of the port of Veracruz by the U.S. Navy. MacArthur was sent to Veracruz as a military advisor. However, he soon went beyond his job description when he recruited some local railroad engineers and headed out to commandeer a number of trains that were believed to be sitting several miles down the line. To get there, he and his small group used a handcar. The group were able to commandeer a total of five engines. On the way back to headquarters, they came under attack from rebels on horseback. MacArthur shot at least three of the attackers. When he returned, he noticed that there were bullet holes in his clothing, yet he remained unscathed. MacArthur's commanding officer he was greatly impressed by this daring ingenuity. He recommended MacArthur for the Medal of Honor. However, the Honors Board questioned the advisability of this enterprise having been undertaken without the knowledge of the commanding general on the ground. So, by 1915, MacArthur he was back in Washington, D.C., where he immersed himself in his work at the War Department. In 1915, he was promoted to Major. A short time later, he was made the Army's first chief of the Bureau of Information, which was essentially a military press office. His experience taught him valuable lessons about the power of the press and the need to cultivate a very strong public persona. The United States entered into World War I in April of 1917. MacArthur wanted the National Guard to be sent to Europe to play their part in the war effort. He came up with the idea of a rainbow National Guard force that was made up of guardsmen from every state. This avoided any interstate rivalry. As a result, he became Chief of Staff of the 42nd Rainbow Division. It left for France in October of 1917. The 42nd Rainbow Division was posted behind front lines in order to complete their training. MacArthur's duties they were largely administrative something which was a source of great frustration for him. He longed to get in on the action, going so far as to volunteer for trench raids with a neighboring French division. On one such raid, MacArthur found himself under gas attack, yet he still managed to make it to safety. The French they were extremely impressed with his actions, awarding him the Croix de Guerre. As well as volunteering to help on French raids, he eventually led some American ones. Every time, he was the first man over the top, and his bravery it didn't go unnoticed. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, and in June of 1917, he was promoted to Brigadier General. He won two more Distinguished Service Crosses, leading his men in a defensive mission during the Kaiser's Offensive in the summer of 1918. The horrors that he witnessed during that offensive prompted him to make the quip. Whoever said the pen is mightier than the sword obviously never encountered automatic weapons. Yet, MacArthur excelled in the thick of battle. By the end of July 1918, he had earned himself four Silver Stars, two Croix de Guerre, and the French Legion of Honor. Still, he wasn't done. During the Great American Offensive, of October of 1918, he won two more Silver Stars, and despite being gassed, he refused to stay out of the thick of the action. He came into contact with future General George Patton, who called MacArthur the bravest man I've ever met. The climax of MacArthur's World War I experience was the taking of the French city of Châtillon. After spotting a weakness in the German defenses, he led an attack that overran the town. The capture of Châtillon was a key victory in the final weeks of the war, and it won him yet another Distinguished Service Medal. Returning to the United States as a celebrated war hero, MacArthur was assigned to Camp Meade, Maryland, for a time before being returned to Washington, D.C. He was involved in preparing a manual on the best use of a new weapon of war, the tank. After studying the subject, he became convinced that tanks should be used for more than just infantry support. They should constitute a separate fighting force of their own. In 1922, MacArthur married Louise Brooks Cromwell, described by the New York Times as one of Washington's most beautiful and attractive young women. She was also one of the richest, coming from a wealthy dynasty. Louise, who brought two young children to the marriage, had previously courted MacArthur's superior, General Pershing. The older man was not happy with the situation, 
threatening to send MacArthur to the Philippines if he went ahead with the marriage. In less than a year, MacArthur was indeed sent to the Philippines as a commander of a brigade in the Philippine Division. It was during this posting that he established close ties to the Philippine ruling powers. He also witnessed firsthand the poor treatment of the indigenous people, becoming a champion of their rights. In 1925, MacArthur was promoted to Major General and brought back to the United States as the commander of the Fourth Corps in Georgia. Lingering civil war tensions made his command untenable, and he was transferred to the Third Corps in Maryland. By 1927, MacArthur's marriage, though, they was in trouble. He and Louise, they were just too different, and though he was devoted to her two children, they separated at the end of that year, and they were officially divorced two years later, in 1929. MacArthur then decided to throw himself into a new role. He was given the role of President of America's Olympic Committee for the 1928 Games in Amsterdam. In one famous incident during the Games, when the US boxing coach threatened to withdraw the team due to perceived bias on the judging panel, MacArthur pulled him aside and told him, Americans don't quit. Following the Olympics, MacArthur was sent back to the Philippines. Then, in 1930, he was appointed U.S. Army Chief of Staff, the youngest man at the time to hold that position. He made important administrative changes during the difficult Depression years, yet the most noteworthy episode during his tenure as Chief of Staff came in 1932, when he oversaw the Army's response to a protest by war veterans in Washington. During the confrontation, soldiers fired on the veterans, with several of them being killed. The backlash? It fell squarely on MacArthur's shoulders, and his reputation it suffered a setback. With the election of Franklin Roosevelt to the presidency, tensions between the commander-in-chief and his chief of staff they reached an all-time high. When Roosevelt refused to increase the military budget, MacArthur made the following caustic comment. When we lose the next war, and an American boy lying in the mud with an enemy bayonet through his belly and an enemy foot on his dying throat spits out his last curse, I wanted the name not to be MacArthur, but Roosevelt. Despite their differences, Roosevelt and MacArthur they had a mutual respect for one another. The four-year chief of staff post was extended by a full year by the president. In 1935, MacArthur once more went to the Philippines. This time, he came at the personal invitation of President Manuel Quezon to act as a military advisor in order to create a defense force on the island. To take up the role, he retired from active service in the U.S. Army. In July 1941, Roosevelt brought MacArthur back. He appointed him commander of the U.S. forces in the Far East. The immediate focus, naturally, was to build up U.S. forces in the Philippines. Five months later, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor brought the United States into the war. It seemed clear to MacArthur that the Philippines was to be the next Japanese target. That attack came within just two weeks. MacArthur had neither the manpower nor the time to prepare a proper defense force, and half of his air force was simply wiped out. On December the 22nd, Japan advanced on Manila. Acting on his own initiative, MacArthur pulled his forces back to the Bataan Peninsula. He set up his headquarters on the island's fortress of Corregidor. With him was his personal press corps, which allowed him to publicize his valiant defenses against the Japanese. However, his forces and supplies they were too few, and his situation it was hopeless. President Roosevelt gave the command for him to evacuate Bataan. At first, he refused, only complying when Roosevelt promised to give him his own theater of operations in the Pacific. MacArthur he then escaped from Bataan, making a daring getaway by sea. However, his forces they stayed on the island. They were overtaken by the Japanese in April of 1942, with many dying in the ensuing Bataan death march. MacArthur now set up his base of operations in Australia. It was from there that he made his famous promise. I said to the people of the Philippines, whence I came, I shall return. For two years, he worked indefatigably to make that promise a reality. Roosevelt appointed him as Supreme Commander of the Southwest Pacific Area. He worked closely with the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Navy, Admiral Charles Nimitz. Together, they devised a plan that would attack the Japanese through the Central Pacific Islands, which was Nimitz's focus, and then oust them from the Philippines, which MacArthur was committed to doing. They called this Operation Cartwheel. Nimitz advanced his naval forces through the Solomon Islands, while MacArthur advanced along the Northeast Corridor of New Guinea. He used a strategy that he called island hopping, in which he bypassed the main areas of Japanese strength. During this time, MacArthur's reputation among the American public it had achieved hero status. By the end of 1944, he was poised to invade the Philippines. However, the authority for the invasion was denied by both Admiral Nimitz and the President. With the aid of his well-tuned publicity machine, he managed to pressure a change of mind, and the go-ahead was ultimately given for the invasion. On October the 19th, 1944, MacArthur landed at the Leyte Gulf. Over the next few months, he pushed on to fully liberate the Philippines. His men finally crossed the central plain to take control of the capital 
capital at Manila in March of 1945. MacArthur received the Japanese surrender at Tokyo Bay on September 2, 1945. Following the war, he was placed in command of the operation of the Allied occupation of Japan. He was charged with rebuilding the Japanese economy and demobilizing their military. In 1950, MacArthur served as commander of the United Nations forces in the Korean War. His tenure it came to an unceremonious end the following year when ongoing tensions with President Truman on the approach towards the Chinese led to his dismissal as UN Commander-in-Chief. Truman was attempting to pursue a peaceful negotiation with the Chinese, while MacArthur was a vocal advocate for military intervention. The situation became untenable when he wrote a letter to a Republican senator calling for a military invasion of China. The letter it was read aloud in Congress. This gave Truman the excuse he needed to get rid of the troublemaking general. MacArthur learned about his firing through a radio report. MacArthur, though, was very popular with the public, and this created a backlash against Truman, with many people calling for his impeachment. With his typical caustic style, Truman addressed the situation with the following. I fired him because he wouldn't respect the authority of the president. That's the answer to that. I didn't fire him because he was a dumb son of a bitch, although he was, but that's not against the law for generals. If it was, half to three quarters of them would be in jail. His firing by Truman had made MacArthur even more popular than ever. Upon his return to the US, he was given a ticker tape parade through the streets of New York City, the largest that the city had ever seen. He was invited to give a farewell address to Congress, in which he delivered the famous line, That old soldiers never die. They just fade away. He moved into the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York, where he remained for the rest of his days. His retirement years were spent in quiet seclusion. However, in 1961, he was contacted by President Kennedy and asked for advice on the Asian situation. MacArthur told him to stay out of Vietnam. In 1961, MacArthur made his final trip to the Philippines, where he met with old friends. On his return to the States, he began working on his autobiography. The end came on April 5, 1964, as a result of liver disease. He was honored with a full state funeral, with more than 150,000 people paying their respects to one of America's great titans of war. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. We put out videos several times per week, so by doing that you'll find out all about them. Also, if you'd like these in the audio format, maybe you drive or do things where you can't really watch them all the time, why not check out the audio version of this YouTube channel? You can find it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Biographics. It'll come up. And as always, thank you for watching.